So, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the official opening of today's session on conserving and using uh, genetic diversity. Um, of course, we, it's unfortunate we missed our keynote speaker, uh, but nevertheless, um, our uh, first speaker of the session has uh, all the credits to fill the gap. So, uh, this session will be chaired by uh, my colleague, uh, Delphine Gribe from uh, INEA, and myself. I'm Phil Arvanopoulos from the Aristotle University of Saloniki. Um, our, our job today is mainly to flash the yellow and green cards to those who are late. So a red card won't kick you out of the conference, but uh, still it would be good to avoid it. So it's uh, um, uh, my pleasure to introduce the first speaker of the day, uh, Christian Lepstad, who will uh, talk about geographic environmental determinants of neutral and adaptive genetic variation in sweet spots by, uh, um, sorry, stone by. So, uh, Christian, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Before I start, I have to say two little things. First of all, this is uh, not Gentry data, this is a Swiss National Science Foundation funded project on sweet adapt adaptation of Swiss stone pine. And second, um, most of the work done here was done by Benjamin Duffa, sitting in the audience, so the full credit actually goes to him and not to me. So we all know that the assessment of genetic diversity and its environment, uh, environment factors driving that this diversity are of enormous importance for conservation and forest management. And this is especially true in times of massive human-induced changes like land use change or climate change. So it's important to determine the spatial distribution of genetic diversity, and we know that this genetic diversity is not distributed randomly across space. Among others, it's influenced by, this ge by the geographic position of the population, so I call it here the peripherality, and it's influenced by environmental conditions, which is the habitat suitability of certain sites. Um, but not only in space, but also across the genome, genetic diversity is not distributed evenly. We have different processes of shaping genetic diversity. So for example, new, uh, we have the neutral genetic diversity within the genome, the regions that is shaped mainly by demographic processes. But we also have selection that shapes uh, the diversity across the genome, and this we call adaptive genetic diversity. The central abundance hypothesis states that species abundance is largest at the center of its geographical range and it gets uh, lower gradually towards the peripheral areas. So this is an example of the scissor tail flycatcher, a bird, and you can see that the abundance is highest in the center of the distribution and lowest at its margin with some exceptions. However, it has been found that many species do actually not conform to the central abundance hypothesis, and this is mainly because uh, the best suitable habitats are not always in the center of the distribution. So it might actually be, and in many cases, that species distribution models might better describe species abundance uh, than the central abundance hypothesis. And now we can, and, uh, the central abundance hypothesis and species distribution model have used in the context of genetic diversity if we assume that large core populations uh, uh, have, high popula have a large population size and a lot of exchange with its neighborhood populations, this uh, leads to high diversity. And here we have an example of Arabidopsis lyrata in North America. It, probably you cannot see, it's a bit small. They correlated uh, genetic diversity with distance to the uh, geographic center and genetic diversity with distance to the niche center. And in both cases, they got a negative uh, correlation, meaning that the genetic diversity is highest in the center of the distribution and highest at the, uh, in the niche, in the best suitable habitat. However, all studies, or most studies that we have, do not distinguish between neutral processes and, and adaptive processes. The, for example, these authors, they just took all the SNPs they had available, so it's rather a neutral measure. 
So this study has two very simple main questions. So the, we do geographic peripherality and habitat suitability correlate with genetic diversity? And do we find differences when we consider overall diversity, neutral diversity, and adaptive diversity? And to study something like that, we need a system that fulfills several criteria. I think first we need high, strong selection pressure to see an effect. We need heterogeneous habitats, so we can uh, look at habit, uh, different values of habitat suitability. And we need species that has, that where geographic peripherality and habitat suitability does not highly correlate, because if they highly correlate, we cannot disentangle the two effects on genetic diversity. According to these questions, we can put several hypotheses. Basically, this, for the neutral loci, we have the central abundance hypothesis saying that genetic diversity is highest in the, in the center of the distribution and lowest at the peripheral distribution. This is again, because, as I said, because of high population size and a lot of gene flow leading to high diversity. And vice versa, we, have, uh, we should have high genetic diversity at suitable habitats because normally in suitable habitats we have large populations. When it comes to adaptive genetic diversity, we would not expect any correlation between the position of the population and its diversity just because the geographic, geographic position per se does not have something to do with selection. When, I, when it comes to uh, habitat suitability, we, there are two different scenarios possible. If we have migration rate much higher than selection uh, pressure, then selection, then selection, we would uh, have a similar pattern like in the neutral loci. But if selection is much higher than migration rate or gene flow, we would actually expect that genetic diversity is lowest at suitable habitats because these populations are adapted to the highly suitable habitat and therefore have reduced genetic diversity at the adaptive loci. So, we used the Swiss stone pine to test this hypothesis. It's a keystone tree species at the Timberline Ecotone. It has a fragmented distribution in Central European Alps and Carpathian Mountains. Very long generation time, so it needs about 40 years to, to, until you see the first viable seeds. It's largely outcrossing, wind pollinated, but when it comes to seeds, it's, it's, it's dispersal is very limited. So that's because it's bound to the spotted nutcracker, a bird that collects the seeds to get to store food for winter. Besides uh, being dispersed by the, by the bird, its elevational and geographic distribution is also limited by biotic factors and climate. A little problem here, it has an extremely large genome, 29 gigabase pairs, and therefore, consequently, no reference genome available. So far, never, nobody has attempted to do it. So this species actually fulfills the criteria I said before, high selection pressure at very high altitude, very heterogeneous habitats, and the complex demography which should actually de uh, decouple the peripherality and the habitat suitability. This is our sampling design. We, we sampled 24 populations. These are the white dots here across the Swiss range. Green is the range, uh, the range limit on the northern and southern, uh, so northern and southern range limit, and we, within each population we sampled uh, coordinates and uh, needles of 20 juvenile trees, and uh, for DNA extraction we needed these needles. As I said, we sampled coordinates so we could calculate the geographic peripherality of each population. Since we don't have this very normal um, sphere-like distribution of the species, we had to do it by calculating the distance to the range limit. So the peripherality is basically the distance of the white dot to the nearest green line. So we could not calculate the distance to the core because defining the core here, uh, the center of the distribution is pretty difficult. Then we collected for the whole species range, we collected environmental data at a resolution of 100 meters, 15 topographic variables, 19 bioclaims, and we did a species distribution model for the whole Swiss range. And it was an ensemble model consisting of five different models. However, what we were mainly interested in was the habitat suitability values for our 24 populations. From the genetic side, we used pooled exome capture, 
uh, that resulted in 17,000 SNPs, 3.8 million invariant signs, which we needed for the calculation of nucleotide diversity. And these sites were distributed across 4,700 contexts, which you call, could call genes. So now it gets a bit complicated, but the main goal of our study was to correlate neutral diversity with our two parameters and adaptive genetic diversity with our two parameters. So we had to split the SNP set into different subsets. So we what we did, we have an overall snob, uh, SNP set where we use all SNPs, and then we have four, each four corresponding neutral and adaptive SNP set. First, we defined adaptive SNPs based on Tajima's D. That's a measure for genetic diversity. Then we did, and we had the corresponding neutral SNP set here. Then we have one adaptive SNP set based on Pi, also genetic uh, gene diversity, uh, nucleotide diversity, and the corresponding neutral SNP set. We defined one based on an outlier test and the corresponding neutral SNP set one on environmental association, so the correlation of genetic variation with environmental variation, and the neutral SNP set. And finally, we had a tenth overall neutral SNP set where we excluded all the SNPs that had showed any sign of adaptation in the four approaches. So we ended up with 10 SNP sets, and for every SNP set, we calculated four estimates of genetic diversity, which is the proportion of polymorphic loci, expected heterozygosity, Pi, again, and Watterson theta. And now these 40 estimates, we try to correlate with geographic peripherality and habitat suitability of the populations. Most importantly, geographic peripherality and habitat suitability in our system are only moderately correlated. So we have a significant correlation of habitat suitability and peripherality but it's not very strong, so we think it's strong enough to disentangle the effects of these two factors on genetic diversity. Now let's get to the results. You don't have to read this. What I want to point you is at the yellow region here. Yellow means significant and not yellow means not significant. So this is the overall and neutral genetic diversity sets, six SNP sets, the blue one is the all SNPs, and the green one are the, the neutral SNP sets. So all genetic measures in all genetic, in all neutral SNP sets were negatively, significantly correlated with geographic peripherality. So we have a lower genetic diversity in peripheral populations, higher genetic diversity in core populations. When it comes to habitat suitability, we had no single co uh, significant correlation. Very clear pattern. Now the same results for adaptive genetic uh, diversity. We have here, we have four different SNP sets. We had almost no significant correlation with three exceptions. Two concerned the adaptive SNP set based on pi. Here, this SNP set showed the same behavior like uh, the neutral SNP sets. So what we think is going on here is that our SNP set here is what's not so easy to define, still contains a considerable amount of neutral SNP sets, neutral SNPs, and therefore has the same pattern like the neutral SNPs. So when it comes to habitat suitability, we had no significant correlation except one high, very highly significant case, which is the, he the heterozygosity in the adaptive SNP set based on Tajima's D. So here we had a negative correlation, meaning at the, at the in very suitable habitats, we had reduced genetic diversity, and in unsuitable habitats, we have high genetic diversity. Here's a look at the detailed result, just for expected heterozygosity in the Tajima's D SNP set. Now I lost, no, I have still have it. Significant correlation negative of uh, geographic peripherality with expected heterozygosity, and the same for habitat suitability with. Uh, heterozygosity in the adaptive SNP set, and no significant correlation for the other two comparisons. So we can come back to our hypothesis and see uh, how, it, how if we can full, uh, uh, fulfill them or not. Let's first look at neutral loci. Neutral genetic diversity 
is higher in central populations, in the center of the geographic distribution, and lower at the peripheral populations. As I said, most likely because in the center we have large populations well connected with gene flow leading to high diversity, whereas at the peripheral we have isolated small populations that have a low diversity. We do not see the pattern we expected according to the central abundance hypothesis for habitat suitability, and this is most likely because we have no strong correlation between peripherality and habitat suitability. So the large populations are not, not necessarily in the core, in the niche center. When we go to the adaptive uh, genetic diversity, as expected, no correlation between geographic position of the population and, adapt and, and selection patterns, but when we come to habitat suitability, normally no correlation, but in one case, we have this interesting correlation where we have uh, reduced genetic diversity in suitable habitats and high genetic diversity in unsuitable habitats. And what we think is going on here, that here we have populations that have undergone strong selection pressures already. They are highly, uh, uh, highly adapted to their suitable habitat and therefore uh, show gel low genetic diversity. Whereas in marginal populations, these are probably very unstable, unstable conditions. We have uh, populations that are probably still undergoing uh, selection processes. Since I have a bit more time, uh, this is a nice side result uh, that, we, that we found. We also looked at if we, uh, what are the driving environmental factors for the species distribution model and the environmental association, uh, environmental association analysis. So environmental association, here we correlate genetic diversity with environmental factors. And in, in species distribution models, we basically find out which environmental factors are driving this distribution of the species. And interestingly, they are not at all the same. So when we look at the SDM, it's, it's mean temperature per year that is driving the species distribution. That's clear for Pinosembra. They live at the very end of the altitudinal distribution. So if you compare presences and absences, of course, altitude, temperature will have a large effect on the species distribution. However, if you look what is driving uh, uh, adaptive genetic diversity, it's rather precipitation and radiation, at least in our system. And this also makes sense because the species is pushed already into this extreme environment, so temperature is probably not so different between populations, but it's rather these factors that are different or not driving the, the adaptive processes at the moment. And this is a general trend if you try to uh, correlate, uh, what is this, number of significant associations with the SDM importance, or you can also look, use effect size of the environmental association and the SDM importance, you find no correlation. Here's actually an example of James Borrell from this year, who is also in the audience, I think. They found actually almost perfect uh, correlation of which environmental factors are driving the distribution and which environmental factors are driving the adaptive patterns. So you might also find this depending on your system. So to come to an end, what are, are the implications for conservation? First of all, I think it's important to say that the assessment of genetic diversity is feasible for such a species with an extremely large genome. It's not easy, but if you use some tricks like pool, sequ pool sequencing or a targeted capture, it's not so difficult, actually not even that expensive. It is important, our results clearly show that we have different patterns between neutral diversity and adaptive diversity, so it is important to distinguish between those two things and not just put them into one pot. Measures of adaptive genetic diversity should therefore increasingly be used for conservation decisions. However, concretely, how you want to use our results now to, pres to, you, to preserve populations, it's not so straightforward. For example, our results show that single core populations have reduced adaptive genetic diversity. So uh, what should we do with them? But we, what I think is that if you take several core populations, you have still a very high adaptive genetic diversity across these core populations. The single populations have reduced diversity, but within the core, the adaptive diversity is most likely high. So we could preserve several large core populations as GCUs, genetic conservation units, 
but probably we don't need to preserve these populations because they're already large and well uh, and prominent. On the other side, it seems that marginal populations carry a lot of adaptive diversity, so probably these are the populations that we should actually preserve because together they carry the, the, the diversity that we probably need for future change. With this I want to end, I want to thank all the people that helped us in the field and when analyzing these things. So SNF for funding the project and you for your, your attention. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Christian, for this very nice presentation. Questions? Uh, thank you. Uh, it was a very, very interesting talk. I, I, was, I wanted to ask about this, uh, this hypothesis that you presented in the beginning. Um, so if these peripheral populations in neutral loci have lower diversity or expected to have lower diversity because of the smaller population size, don't you also expect that the selection is less stronger in the peripheral? And, and is that taken into account in the predictions? For the, adapt for the adaptive ones? Yeah. I don't know if you can say something about if it's stronger or not, but probably more effective or not, I would say, yes. In, but if the population size is smaller, yeah. then it's less effective, right? Yes, I mean, that's <laughs> why I say it's not strong, but it's less, it's about the effectiveness, yes. Yes, could be, but we were, we, I mean, we just, I mean, you can put several different hypotheses to this, to this slide. We just decided to use those because we just think just your position alone should not influence the adaptive uh, processes. That's what we thought. Yeah, but yes, good idea. Um, Marta from Imra Bordo. A uh, very interesting talk, thank you. Um, I was wondering if you consider also the entire distribution of these species, because it's a very small area, and how this can change the relationship that you find between the marginality and the geographic distribution, the, or habitat suitability, the relationship with climate, the geographic and climatic marginality, if you have tried to consider differently these parameters. No, I mean, we haven't tested, we have only these samples from the Swiss range, so I can actually not say anything. I would expect similar patterns, because I think that uh, the species occupies quite a specific niche, and I think that, uh, we, at least from the environmental, from the habitat suitability side, we would not expect uh, a lot of differences. And also from the distribution, it's this banana-like distribution that we have in Europe, so like this corridor in the high mountains, so I would expect a similar patterns. But of course, if you go comes to detecting uh, adaptive uh, genetic diversity, which contexts, which SNPs are involved, it can dramatically change when you go to a new region. So that's clear. Yeah, nice talk. Um, I am also recycling questions, but from a different conference now. Um, given the genome size of your species and the way uh, selective regimes operate within a genome, I was wondering whether using SNPs is adequate to account for uh, these uh, reduced uh, uh, diversity processes, given how mutations accumulate or do not, do not accumulate within the site frequency spectrum within a genome or within a genomic region. What is your alternative suggestion to measure genetic diversity in such a species of large genome? Um, sequencing? The whole genome. No, not the whole genome, but the specific regions. Yeah. I don't know, exome capture, for instance, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. many is exome tra capture. But uh, I mean, of course, yes, we are looking only at the small part, can we say that, of the genome, but at least we cover about 5,000 genes. So we started from 25,000 genes. We designed probes for 23,000 and we ended up with 5,000. So we cover at least a few thousand genes. It's, I think it's quite nice. But of course, we can never cover the whole genome. I mean, this no, I know. will no, go the, beyond. The thing is that you're only concentrating on the SNPs, the, 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 the very side who are uh, changing, you know, the whole region. Yeah. Which this is not more. completely true, so when we calculate pi, well, this okay. is what you said there, okay. we calculate it per contig. Okay. Well, that's a, so I, I can that part. defend myself a little bit. Great. Otherwise, it's SNP based, you're right. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any more hands, so a uh, big applause for Christian for his nice presentation.